Before we get started, uh, I think that Brendan had a, a few words here on the intro slide. Everyone, thanks for coming out. This is the summer trivia guess the diagnosis event hosted by Dr. Stephen Roth, oral and maxillofacial pathologist. We love this event. This is always an educational and a great way to spread oral pathology and awareness um, in, in you know our space. And we're hosting it. It's hosted by um, the students of dentistry team. So I just wanted to introduce everyone. We have obviously Dr. Stephen Roth here, um, our, our event host. We have Sarah who helped put together our story posts for awareness. Um, we have Siraj Shah, who is the podcast manager, Dose of Dental. We're going to be putting this out on there. Dr. Roth's going to be putting it out on his YouTube channel, our YouTube channels, my own personal podcast as well. Um, Sean Zar and I, we co-founded uh, Students of Dentistry and our other pages years ago, six, seven years ago now. Um, Brandon Axelrod, our one of our account managers. We're the Students of Dentistry team. We're here together, and we're, we're looking forward to hosting this event with you. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. Dr. Roth, take it away. Perfect. Yeah. And unfortunately, this month, I just learned what was taking me so long was I was trying to get a streaming on YouTube, but apparently you have to get, you have to wait 24 hours from requesting it. So next, uh, next season we'll be streaming live on YouTube as well, but welcome to summer 2023. If this is your first time, we're going to be going over 15 multiple choice questions to test your oral pathology skills. The way that it is scored is time and accuracy. So you will have 20 seconds per question. The quicker you answer the question correctly, the more points you get. So cheating does not help you out in this case. Uh, cheating will not help you win. So the quicker you can get the right answer, the better off you'll be. We also want to give a special shout out to V Coterie for uh, being an additional sponsor for this event. They have a $50 gift card that anyone can win. So of course, we have our first, second, and third place prizes. First place will be taking home a $100 gift card, second $50, and third $25. This is a great time for the Amazon gift card, being that Prime Day is today. But anyone can win this $50 gift card to Vcoterie. And I was browsing their website earlier today. They've got a lot of really cool jewelry. Uh, not for me, but the pins are. I already have a full card of, of punny dad pun pins. So stick around. The way that we'll be giving that out is after the last question is over and we've revealed the winners. Everyone that is still around will put their email address in to the chat. The, the email addresses will then be uh, randomly chosen, and you'll be receiving an email as to uh, how to redeem that gift card. So even if you're not playing and you're just spectating, if you're here at the end, then you are eligible to win that prize. So stick around. It's anyone's uh, chance to win that. But of course, we got to get into the competition. As mentioned, these are our socials. Be sure to follow that. Uh, of course, there's me at the end. All of these are Instagram handles, and I'm also on YouTube. Let's rock and roll. We're going to start off with a practice question. And which option best describes you? This is for zero points, so no worries about time. Are you pre-dental, pre-med? Are you a dental or medical student? Are you a resident? Or are you practicing slash other if you're not in in healthcare at all if you are uh hanging out with us as a novice let's see okay so mostly dental students with uh, a few pre-dent and a few pros one resident all right rock and roll so this is for real this is a five-year-old patient, and they were hospitalized at four months old for heat stroke. I'm going to show you a picture. What syndrome do they have? Here's your picture. Is it Gardner syndrome, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, ectodermal dysplasia, or cleidocranial dysplasia? Five-year-old patient, hospitalized at four months old for heat stroke. What do they have? Which of these four syndromes? Get in those answers. All right, ectodermal dysplasia. So what you saw there, at the age of five, the patient should have a full set of primary dentition, but they only have one tooth erupted and it's malformed. So that shows that the teeth are malformed and the patient also has oligodontia or lack of teeth. 
the heat stroke comes from the lack of development of sweat glands. So what happens is at very young age, it can be very, uh, it can become an emergent situation where babies are getting heat stroke because they're unable to sweat because they actually don't have sweat glands because they were never formed. This type of ectodermal dysplasia, which there are many, is called hypohydrotic, hypohydrotic ectodermal dysplasia when they don't have sweat glands. In addition to other features that we see, which I'll show you here on the next slide, Dr. Gallagher in first place with KS and Chris rounding out second and third, but it's still early, anyone's game. We got uh, 14 more questions to go. And here's another picture of our kiddo that was in the previous slide. The other things that you can see here is that the patient has thin, wispy, blonde hair. The hair is also formed by the ectoderm, which is that embryologic structure that gives rise to skin, hair, teeth, sweat glands, and melanocytes, which give people pigment, which is why these patients tend to be blonde hair and blue eyes. These patients also can have a more pointed nose and uh, more lax ears in addition to all of these other findings. And thanks to Dr. Noblo for providing that case. She does a lot of really great work uh, in restoring these kiddos. Question number two, what is the most common adenogenic tumor? Is it squamous cell carcinoma, amyloblastoma, pleomorphic adenoma or Pinborg tumor? What is the most common odontogenic being the key here? Odontogenic tumor deriving from the tooth structures odontogenic. Let's see how we did here. All right, amyloblastoma. So squamous cell carcinoma is the most common malignant tumor in the oral cavity. Uh, it is 90% of oral cancers are squamous cell carcinoma. Pleomorphic adenoma is the most common salivary tumor. Uh, Pinborg tumor is an adenogenic tumor that a lot of people like because it's someone's name, but it's super duper rare. We don't see it very often at all. And amyloblastoma is the correct answer. That is the most common donogenic tumor. We had one today coming through our biopsy service, but it is not common. So we see these relatively rarely, but that doesn't mean that they don't happen. Uh, and out of all of the donogenic, meaning the tumors that come from tooth structure, it is the most common, amyloblastoma. Let's see how we did there. Oh, a shakeup in the leaderboard. All three positions except KS jumping to first, but a replacement of second and third. Still early, still anybody's game. Let's go to question three. Leuco derives from the Greek word leukos, meaning what? Cell, patch, cancer, or white? Cell, patch, cancer, or white? Leukos. The Greek word. We're learning uh, foreign languages tonight. Really testing your, your skills here. Indeed, some trivia. Let's see how we did on this one. Yeah, very good. White is the answer. White is the answer. Let's see that leaderboard. Oh, man, we had our, our second place dropped out, given uh, Ashton a, a, a chance to pull into second here. We've got a three-player streak, a three-player streak. That's great. That's great. We got upward movement. So leuco is pretty common in medicine. Uh, we know now that it means white. Leucoplakia means white patch. Leukocyte is white cell or white blood cell. And leukemia is an increase in white bl blood cells circulating in the blood. Emia meaning circulating in the blood. Leuk meaning coming from Lucos. Uh, if anyone is a subscriber to my YouTube channel, this is the most recent YouTube video on leukoplakia. So if you were subscribed, that would have been a nice little hint. Always a good idea to, uh, to maybe subscribe to get some other trivia hints in the future. Next question, what is the name of the pictured tooth anomaly? This is a picture question. Is this dens invaginatus, dens evaginatus, dense perivaginatus or dense necrovaginatus. We got a pictured tooth anomaly here in a radiograph. The key here is this, the infolding structure there. Let's see how we did. 
Oh, the second most common answer. So this one, this one stumps some people. Some people went for evaginatus. So dens invaginatus is when the tooth folds inward on itself, as opposed to dens evaginatus, where it folds outward and creates an extra little cusp tip. So dens invaginatus was what was pictured because we had a deep pit that the tooth folded in on itself. A lot of these teeth die very quickly and become necrotic which is why you saw that big old periapical radiolucency because it became necrotic. So that periapical radiolucency is because the tooth is dead because it infolded on itself. Dens invaginatus, also known as dens in dente. Okay, Erica pulling into fourth, shaking up that leaderboard. Welcome to the top. Three players with a four question answer streak. Very good, our, our oral path pros. All right, coming up next, number five. Which of the following is the name of a topical steroid gel? Fluocinonide, fluconazole, fluticasone, or fluoxetine? Fluocinonide, fluconazole, fluticasone, or fluoxetine? Lots of fluos. This makes it very difficult for patients because they often get these mixed up. So it's important to know the difference. And obviously the answer is fluocinonide with ties on the other side of the board. Fluconazole is obviously our antifungal. This is the one that most commonly gets confused for fluocinonide because sometimes they're prescribed at the same time. Fluticasone is a steroid that's sprayed in the nose, used usually for allergies, and fluoxetine is an SSRI used in depression and other mental illnesses. So fluocinonide gel is one of the topical steroid gels. You might know it as Lidex. There's also clobetazole gels uh, and triamcinolone dental paste, which usually aren't as well tolerated by the patient. Steroid gels are usually the most tolerated by patients, and fluocinonide is one of them. Oh, a shakeup, AA taking the lead with 100%. Look at AA. We got an oral path star there with five correct answers in a row. That's 100%. I like how these, these little emojis look sad now. That's, that's kind of sad, but also a little funny. But look at that. All right, let's make those uh, little emojis happy again with the, with the right answer. This is number six, ulcers in an immunocompetent, meaning they have their immune system, patient with a red halo on movable mucosa pictured here. Is that traumatic, aphthous, squamous cell carcinoma, or recurrent intraoral HSV, herpes simplex? The key here is immunocompetent. Their immune system is intact and it has a red halo on movable mucosa. Each of these is an important aspect of this question. Very good, aphthous ulcer, a traumatic ulcer, is going to have a white blended border. Squamous cell carcinoma is usually gonna be solitary and ugly looking. And then recurrent intraoral HSV and an immunocompetent patient is going to be on fixed mucosa like gingiva, not on the soft palate or the uvula or the tongue. Uh, now, if the patient is immunosuppressed, they can get recurrent intraoral herpes simplex outside of that context on the, the lips or on the tongue or the buccal mucosa. But if the patient has an intact immune system, a red halo ulcer that goes away is a aphthous ulcer or canker sore. Oh, AA. Oh, you still got 100%. I don't know why the emoji is sad there. You still got that question right, it looks like. But KS is back in the lead. Clay, our previous champ, pulling into third, shaking up our leaderboard coming back for his title. All right, coming up next is seven. What systemic condition is associated with aphthous ulcers? Pictured on our last slide, these can be associated with systemic conditions. Crohn's, celiac, ulcerative colitis, or all of the above. Now, they aren't often associated with systemic disorders, but they can be. A small percentage can be traced back to a systemic disorder, but most aphthous ulcers are, uh, are incidental findings, but that's right. Crohn's, celiac, and ulcerative colitis all can be associated with aphthous ulcers, which is why it's very important to ask your patient with canker sores if they have any GI symptoms. 
If they do, it might be worth a workup for one of these three things. Uh, other things come to mind as well, Bichette syndrome, FAPA syndrome, um, other syndromes, but they're exceedingly rare. So too are vitamin deficiencies. A lot of people blame vitamin B12 and folic acid on aphthous ulcers, but the vast majority of patients with aphthous, aphthous ulcers, we don't know why they happen. And it can be different things for different people. So uh, all of the above can be associated rarely with aphthous ulcers. Most of the time, we don't know. Oh, we got a fight. We got a fight up here uh, between first and second place. It's a tight game with a two-point difference between first and second. And up four places is Richie. Way to go, Richie. You're the top climber that round. All right, here we go, number eight. Biopsies taken for direct immunofluorescence should be submitted in which solution? Buffered formalin, Michelle's solution, RPMI, or paraffin? Which solution do you want to put those DIF biopsies? This here, by the way, is fibrinogen lighting up in a patient with a, a plasminogen deficiency, which leads to excess fibrin. Very good, Michelle's solution. Buffered formalin is for routine biopsies. Uh, RPMI is used for flow cytometry, which is a special test that we do for leukemias and lymphomas. And then paraffin is a fancy way to say wax. So wax is what we put our definitive specimen in. It becomes paraffin embedded in our block. But Michelle's solution is the correct answer, which most people picked. Very good. Not a lot of movement up here on the leaderboard, but Vincent Jackson, welcome to fifth place. Gabby, way to go. You also are our top climber that round up four places with your, your witchy turkey there. That seems like both fall holidays. You got Halloween and Thanksgiving going on. Uh, although I don't think you can pick your, your little emoji guy. I think it gets chosen for you. Number nine, what organ is malfunctioning in this patient pictured here? Is it the kidney, brain, liver, or pancreas? What is going on here? Note that this picture is not tinted. This picture is taken like any other picture. Is it the kidney, brain, liver, or pancreas? What organ is malfunctioning? Note that it has kind of a yellowish hue. Perhaps that's a hint. This patient has jaundice. So yes, the liver is malfunctioning. What happens is bilirubin, bilirubin gets uh, loaded up in the circulating system. It gets deposited in the fat under the skin and in the eyes and other, other organs, including the gingiva and the oral cavity, leading to a generalized yellow appearance, especially of the eyes, of the gums, and of the skin. That usually happens in patients with liver failure. So yes, the liver is malfunctioning in that patient with jaundice. Oh, awesome with a with a comeback with three in a row, three in a row, but our, we still have a, a tight race up here. Uh, AA pulling away a little bit with 800 points, but it's still anyone's game. We're uh, at the two thirds point. We're at the two thirds point. Richie, that uh, climb that you had a few times back benefiting you, you're now in the top five, stealing that fifth place spot. All right, still anyone's game. And of course, we've got that $50 Vcotery gift card for you. These teeth are seen in what condition? Biliary atresia, amelogenesis imperfecta, secondary syphilis, or congenital erythropoietic porphyria? These look a little red to me, perhaps. Is it biliary atresia, amelogenesis imperfecta, secondary syphilis, or congenital erythropoietic porphyria? Which could it be? Yeah, the big long one, congenital erythropoietic porphyria. In biliary atresia, that bilirubin that we were just talking about can get deposited in developing teeth and they can actually look green. Amelogenesis imperfecta, the teeth don't change colors, but they do get worn down very quickly due to the fragile enamel. Secondary syphilis does not change the teeth at all, but congenital syphilis can lead to Hutchinson's incisors that look like uh, screwdriver heads and mulberry molars. And then congenital erythropoietic porphyria can lead to red teeth. That's also uh, sometimes called Gunther's disease or the vampire disease. Not because of the red teeth, but because these patients are very sensitive to the sun. That was a hard question. And Ash, I'm pulling into that leaderboard into third place. We got Chris, a, new, a newcomer to our top five. Gabby is still climbing up, up three places. Way to go, Gabby. 
We got an exciting match on our hand here. We're going to stay on that hard train, that congenital orthopoietic porphyria, this rare disease. And what else can be red? Is it the urine, the skin, the saliva, or the hair? What else can be read in these patients? This patient was actually seen at our hospital. So uh, it's only rare until it's in your chair. This was not pulled from a text or a report. This was pulled from a cell phone that we took of this patient. That is urine, correct? Yeah, the urine can be read. That's where the excess porphyrins are deposited and you can see it in the urine. These patients will have a red brown urine. The skin is indeed sensitive, but it actually leads to excessive breakdown and burning. It doesn't lead to a change in color. Saliva doesn't change at all and neither does the hair. Oh, AA, dropping down to third. That's a tough break. We got Asham in second with his five correct answer streak and pulling into first. We've got KS. Can you believe it? Clay is climbing, staying in the, the battle, though, here, trying to reclaim his victory from last session. And James, welcome to the leaderboard. Number five. That's a nice top hat. So here's what the urine looks like. This is the urine under normal light. We've got normal urine here that is uh, yellow color. And then the porphyrins are deposited red under the um, normal light. But how can you distinguish the excess porphyrins from, let's say, blood? You can actually look at it under black light. The, uh, we, we call them black lights in the club. In the medical lab, we call them wood lights. It's the same thing. Um, but you can see that the urine in the congenital orthopedic porphyria patient is glowing red rather than this other kind of yellowy clear color. Oh, and by the way, if that looks familiar, I recently featured a case on my story. So maybe it's a good idea to, uh, to follow me there for future trivia hints. There was a case posted by Global Dermy, a great case with tooth coloration that I shared within the last week. So we're going to keep on keeping on number 12. We're heading towards the end, rounding the final corner. What is this CT finding? What do we see here? A sialolith, a mucosil, an odontoma, or mucoepidermoid carcinoma? This is a CT image in the axial plane. Let's see how we did on this one. Hopefully a little bit more straightforward. Yeah, sialolith. So it was lighting up. Uh, the same density as the tooth and the bone, meaning it's a hard calcified structure. A mucosil won't be calcified. Uh, mucoepidermoid carcinoma, they're very, very rare cases documented, including one documented uh, by a former NUMIC resident, Dr. Brian Wolf, uh, who included me on his paper. There was bone in that mucoep. However, that's exceedingly, exceedingly rare. There's only two in the literature, so probably not mucoep and it's not gonna be that well-formed. Odontoma only happens in the jaws or in the bone structure where, where tooth formation can occur. Uh, there's not a soft tissue odontoma, but sialoliths, that's a great place for a sialolith along the submandibular duct that runs lingually or inside the mandible. So that is a sialolith on CT. Do we shake anybody up with that one? Uh, no, we held steady. We held steady. But congrats to Nikki, who's up four places. Way to go, Nikki. There's a lot of action going on beyond this top five that, we're, uh, that we can't see, but we know that it's fierce all the way up and down. All right. In what state are you most likely to contract coccidiomycosis? Here is coccidiomycosis, a fungal organism. Can you get it in New York, Arizona? Ohio or Mississippi? Where are you most likely going to get this bug? Is it New York where I am now? Arizona where the Grand Canyon is? Ohio where I'm from? Or Mississippi with that Mississippi River running through? Let's see how we did. Arizona is correct. Arizona is correct. Coccidiomycosis or San Joaquin Valley fever. That's the San Joaquin Valley. I'll show you a distribution map here, but first we got to look at our leaderboard. KS with three in a row, solidifying that lead, but we've got a tight battle here for second and third. Clay just outside of reach, trying to reclaim that first place from last session. But we still we have two more questions left to shake up that leaderboard. And of course, our $50 V-Codery gift card that's anybody's if they stay on till the end of our session here. Here is a map provided by the CDC 
of instances of coccidiomycosis or San Joaquin Valley fever or valley fever. It is mostly the Southwest United States, these like arid environments, dry and hot. That's the name of the game for this bug. Uh, but we can see a little outbreak here in the Washington State, Oregon area, but mostly the Southwest United States. Over here in the Ohio and Mississippi River Valleys, you're more likely, likely going to see histoplasmosis and blastomycosis. Those two are much more common in these areas. All right, second to last question. Which strain of HPV most likely caused this lesion? This is a squamous papilloma on the lip. Is it HPV 6, 13, 16, or 32? 6, 13, 16, or 32. Very good. HPV 6 and 11 and 8 are all benign strains. 16, 18 are our malignant strains, most likely going to cause the uh, oropharyngeal cancer. And then HPV 13 and 32 are involved in a very rare condition called heck disease or focal epithelial hyperplasia or multifocal epithelial hyperplasia. It's all the same name for the same thing. Uh, but usually we use the eponym heck disease, which is multifocal papillomatosis uh, in certain populations. But HPV 6 and uh, 6, 8, and 11 are the most common strains to cause papillomas. Benign, very benign. And a shakeup, Clay, in the leaderboard. Congrats to Sierra, up three places. Asham fallen out, but still one more question to retake our top three. Clay has snuck in. Is it he going to steal the lead again? We got AA trying to hold on, and KS holding steady at second there. This is a, a tight match here down towards the line. James holding steady at fifth place. But we've got our last question. Get your hands on the buzzer. Get ready to go. Which benign neoplasm is most likely to float in formalin? Pleomorphic adenoma, amyloblastoma, hemangioma, or lipoma? Which benign neoplasm is most likely to float in formalin? PA, amylo, mangioma, or lipoma? It's pictured in here. Maybe it looks a little yellow. Let's see how we do. Very good. Very good. We finished with uh, a little the easiest one of the night. This is the one I think most people got most often. So... 14 people got that right. And let's see, I think, all right, perfect. So thank you all for coming. Enter your email in the chat now. Hold on one second, wait, no. Okay, uh, go ahead and enter your email into the chat right now to be eligible to win the uh, V Coterie gift card. If you wanna buy me a gift, I really like the molar bear pin um, or the microscope that says, stay curious. That's uh, Those are the two that are in my basket right now. Be sure to follow us on Instagram, Dosa Dental Podcast, Top Dental Practices, Elite Dentist, Students of Dentistry, and of course, Stephen Roth DDS. I've been your host. Thank you so much for coming out today. Brendan, do you wanna say anything before we reveal the uh, the winners here? Now nah, we're all good. No further ado. Okay. Drum roll. Let's see what's going on. A fun way to spend 45 minutes here on a Wednesday night. Let's see how we did. Here's our podium. In third place, Clay. Clay with the Prime Day gift card. KS in second. So what does that mean? Who's in first? Could it be? Did they hold their spot? Was it stolen? Was it, was, oh, perfect. We got AA holding on to that first place win. So if AA, KS, and Clay could uh, send me an Instagram DM, I'll make sure that we connect you to get your gift cards. Uh, we'll give everyone about five more minutes to enter your email into the chat if you want to be registered for the V Coterie gift card. Actually, we'll, we'll say two, three more minutes just so people can't log on but we will give everyone three more minutes to put in your emails to win that gift card. Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, keep your eye out for future trivia nights. We love having you guys. This is always a very fun event. Thank you all for coming. Enjoy the rest of your evening and hopefully you learn something out of this.